From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, Welcome to Balance of Power. I'm alongside Kaylee Lyons, I'm Joe Matthew. The Fed holds rates steady, raises its inflation outlook, but still predicts three cuts this year. We'll have more with Michael Bright of the Structured Finance Association. Donald Trump suggests he would support a 15-week abortion ban with reproductive rights a key issue, of course, in this election cycle. Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois joins us this hour for more on her legislation aimed at protecting IVF. And Congress is racing the clock up against a midnight Friday funding deadline. But Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell warning the work is likely to extend to the weekend. So, Joe, once again, it's going to be a matter of the clock as of this hour, 5 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday. Yep. We still have not yet seen the text. Yeah, uh, it's supposed to come out Sunday. Then we were told Monday. Now, well, Tuesday. Now, it could be Thursday. Apparently, this could drop at any moment. Kaylee, the funding deadline is midnight Friday. This is making things very difficult for lawmakers who wanted to avoid a shutdown, considering the job left to be done. Absolutely. So we still have remaining questions this evening about fiscal policy, but we did get a bit more clarity on the monetary policy side today as the Fed did hold, ra hold rates steady at their meeting, maintaining their outlook, though, for 25 basis point cuts, three of them this year. Chair Jay Powell spoke earlier to reporters. We believe that our policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle, and that if the economy evolves broadly as expected, it will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. The economic outlook is uncertain, however, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. Joining us now with more here in Washington, Bloomberg's Michael McKee, our chief international economics and policy correspondent. He, of course, was in the room with Chairman Powell, asked a question of him. But the big takeaway seems to be that while the Fed does think inflation may be higher than previously thought this year or by the time we get to the end of it, they still would like to cut rates multiple times, maybe be more tolerant. But of that it was a very close call today. <laughs> and that's what was interesting, because the Fed saw stronger growth, lower unemployment and higher core inflation this year, but barely, just barely maintained the three rate cuts. Uh, they uh, had ele uh, ten, nine members, I'm sorry, nine of the 19 members saw two cuts or fewer, and 10 saw three. If one person had changed their vote, then we would have had two cuts, and the markets probably would have had a completely different reaction. Mm -hmm. You asked, uh, Pal, about inflation dynamics, uh, whether we see more one-off increases that end up fading away, or whether there's a secular turn here. He didn't seem to have... Uh, a perfect answer for that. How concerned is he about this? <laughs> he said, we have the same questions that yeah. you do, <laughs> which made me feel good, I guess. <laughs> uh, they think, in general, that we saw some one-offs, uh, so maybe turn of the year uh, increases in insurance and things like that, but they aren't sure yet, which means they want more time. But there was enough that scared them that they did raise the uh, forecast for core inflation next year. So at this point, um, they're keeping their fingers crossed that their forecast will be okay. Mm -hmm. But a significant number of them did vote to move up their own uh, inflation forecast. So it's possible if we see another bad inflation report that at the next time they do this dot plot, we'll go down to two. Michael McKee, thank you. It's great to have you back in the nation's capital as we enjoy each Fed day. Also in focus, progress on the language for a funding deal to prevent a partial government shutdown. We just haven't seen it yet. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell talked about it earlier. Here he is. My assumption and what I've told our members is we're likely to be here this weekend. That will be determined, however, by how long it stays in the House. What we have recently done, and I think hopefully will work again, is that in return for a certain number of amendments, we can finish it quicker, hopefully, than putting us in a position of shutting down the government. Let's bring in Jonathan Samari from Bloomberg Government. He's just back from the Hill. Jonathan, great to see you. Uh, this is all about the clock at this point. How long the House holds the bill, as uh, Mitch McConnell references, 72 hours is the rule. 
so everyone has a chance to read this. The Freedom Caucus wants to get that time. But those are the same 30 members who would probably vote against this thing anyway. So the Speaker has a decision to make. Can he just bring it to the floor now if he wants to? He could. I mean, this is a rule that's essentially an informal rule. It's not written into law. It's yeah. not, you know, in the Constitution or anything. So he could. And, and Republicans, House Republicans are signaling that they are more likely to ignore that 72-hour rule, bring it out as fast as they can, because lawmakers want to get this done. They don't want to have a partial shutdown. And they're all eyeing this recess that starts next week. They don't want to be here this weekend. Like anybody who's looking at a break, you know, you don't want to work overtime sure. right before you're starting vacation. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, you probably yourself would yeah. prefer not to work this I weekend as well. I wouldn't mind. Nothing personal <laughs> there. Uh, uh, of course, while this funding battle is still on ongoing, or at least the race against the clock is, there were other things going on on the Hill today, including a meeting with Senate Republicans, which was zoomed into by Israeli Prime Minister... Benjamin Netanyahu. Of course, this comes after Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, called on new elections or called for new elections in Israel. What came out of that meeting? And does it influence at all the path forward for supplemental funding, which, of course, has already passed the Senate, but very much remains in question in the House, not just for Israel, but Ukraine as well? Yeah, I don't think it will affect supplemental funding for Israel specifically. I think there's still bipartisan support for sending money to Israel, although there is Democrats who want to put conditions on that aid and Republicans who don't. The Democrats are pretty much divided on it. I think what Netanyahu's visit today combined with Schumer's speech does is it underscores how Netanyahu personally has become essentially a partisan figure, where he is now much more affiliated with the Republican Party. Democrats oppose Netanyahu by and large. Uh, and so that could have an effect in the future of how Israel is viewed. I think at the moment there's still widespread support for Israel, but you see the parties moving in different directions, especially around this specific Israeli government. Once we get through this, it, it, it's unclear in terms of the funding mechanism, whether we shut down or get a continuing resolution. Once we get through this, will, will we have a sense in the next 24 hours or so what the answer is? On the f continuing resolution? If that's needed. We talked yesterday yeah. about maybe a, a brief weekend shutdown, but they're right. pushing this to the line now. We're going to be into next week. They really are. Uh, I don't think, I think they'll find a way to get it done over the weekend. The Senate and the House, they have a way of when there's a recess coming, they're yeah. speeding things up. Um, the issue is that over the weekend, a shutdown, the government isn't really open over the weekend generally mm -hmm. anyway. So we'll see if they need a CR. We, I think we'll have a better sense depending on when they actually put the text out. If they can get it out early tomorrow, maybe they can get it done on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. If it keeps getting kicked back in days and days and days, we might need that short-term stopgap to prevent a shutdown next week. All right, well, we're still waiting at this hour. Jonathan Damari of Bloomberg Government, thank you so much. Elsewhere, President Biden toured an Intel campus outside of Phoenix, Arizona today just after the Commerce Department announced $20 billion in grants and loans to help fund an expansion of that company's semiconductor factories. Next on the president's agenda is Texas, where he'll be meeting with donors in Dallas and Houston. The visit rounding out Biden's trip to three different border states this week. Joining us now with more from Texas is our Texas Bureau Chief, Bloomberg's Julie Fine. So, Julie, we know that Texas is a deep red state. What is Biden's reception likely to be? in the state well, today. Biden's, uh, the president's reception is expected to be very good. He's got three fundraisers, two in Dallas, one in Houston, expected to net over $5 million between the three fundraisers. While Texan, Texas has been a very good cash register for Republicans, there are a lot of Democrats here as well. So the president is expected to get a big haul and a very big reception when he arrives. We've got some news uh, from the Supreme Court. Uh, this landed around this time yesterday, uh, Julie Fine, allowing the state of Texas to begin arresting and deporting people who enter the country illegally. Uh, how is this playing locally, and what does it mean for Governor Greg Abbott? Well, currently there's a stay on this, and this is now back in front of the Fifth Circuit. Uh, this has been playing locally here for some time. It's called Senate Bill 4, and it has been a very challenging issue for lawmakers here in Texas. Well, it passed by the Republican House and it passed by the Republican Senate and signed by the governor. There are a lot of people that are very uncomfortable with this bill, but again, it is ex it was expected to pass. It did pass, and here in Texas, it is a very big part 
of the election this time around. So a lot of eyes are on this law and what will happen next. Now, the Texas law enforcement has been prepared for this. There are law, there are is law enforcement all up and down the border right now. The question is, when will they be able to arrest and deport? They are waiting on the decision from the court. There is no word yet exactly when that will come down. Well, Julie, given the the history of the Fifth Circuit in, in the state of Texas. Is there any idea prevailing thinking as to how exactly the court is likely to rule whenever that time comes? There is no prevailing thinking right now. There is a question whether or not it is split. However, this is one of the most conservative courts in the nation. But there were questions today in the arguments about this bill and its implementation. So this is one that could be a little different for the court to hear. We'll have to wait and see what happened. But that is a great point, Kaylee. This is one of the most conservative courts in the nation. Julie, thanks for being back with us. Bloomberg's Julie Fine, our Texas Bureau Chief here on Balance of Power. Coming up, we'll be joined by Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois. An important conversation on women's reproductive rights and other business in the Senate. It's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The number of weeks now, people are, are agreeing on 15, and I'm thinking in terms of that, and it'll come out to something that's very reasonable. But people are really, even hardliners are agreeing, seems to be 15 weeks, seems to be a number that people are agreeing at. Former President Trump, in a radio interview this week, suggesting a time frame he may consider for a national abortion ban, something we haven't heard before. From him, Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall has more on this issue. Tyler? Hey, Joe. A new report this week finds yearly abortions are on the rise. They were up 10 percent between 2020 and 2023. That's according to data from the Guttmacher Institute. The advocacy group tracked one million cases last year alone. That's the first time in over a decade the number crossed that threshold. The Supreme Court eliminated the constitutional right to an abortion in 2022, leaving decisions up to the states. Since then, 14 states have enacted bans or no longer have abortion care available. The data shows nearly every other state here saw an increase in the number of abortions provided. In the last year, seven states have given voters the chance to decide on abortion access, and each time, abortion rights have been protected. A growing number of states are also likely to see abortion-related measures on the ballot come November. There are a number of states that have initiatives on the ballot, and we see we haven't lost an initiative yet. We saw the surge in turnout. So, yes, this is a very key strategic element of the 2024 elections. The political conversation now includes in vitro fertilization, too. After a ruling in Alabama last month, put Republicans on defense. Top members of the GOP, like former President Trump, came out saying they'd support protections for IVF. But here's how one Republican strategist put it to me. They have to get comfortable talking about the fact that they're in favor of IVF, that this ruling was wrong and has to be changed and, and remedied in some way. But also, too, Republicans need to be better about talking about women's health as a whole, as a priority for the health care system in the country. So far this year, 26 bills have been introduced that would establish what's known as fetal personhood and could impact IVF. Joe and Kelly Bloomberg News reports these types of laws could lead to abortion bans if passed. Definitely legislation to follow at the state level, Tyler. Meanwhile, at the state level and really at the national level in this election cycle, obviously this is an issue that is coming up. How have we seen this characterized when we think about former President Trump, who, of course, is touting 15 weeks versus President Biden? Right. It was interesting to hear former President Trump come out and actually put a time frame. The first time we've heard him say a number on um, the type of time frame we could see for a national abortion ban, also saying that he'd be in, su in support of exceptions. You know, the Republican strategist I spoke to there, Lisa Miller, said that we should expect to see this maybe perhaps more framed as a health care 
conversation. You know, during the State of the Union, President Biden actually had abortion written into the script, and he ended up taking that out, instead talking about this issue as reproductive rights. So we'll have to watch if on the campaign trail we start to see uh, the messaging around abortion, IVF, and other reproductive health care issues come up like this. All right, Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall, great reporting. Thank you so much. And we'll have more on this coming up in just a few minutes. Senator Tammy Duckworth, Duckworth, a Democrat from Illinois who has put forward legislation to protect IVF, is coming up next on Balance of Power. Meanwhile, we do have some breaking news. Reddit, the IPO of which is supposed to begin trading tomorrow, Thursday, is said to price that IPO at $34 per share. That's the top end uh, of the range that had been reported. Again, Reddit pricing that IPO at $34 per share. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. We want to turn now to Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois, who earlier this year introduced legislation aimed at protecting IVF nationally, though it was blocked by one of her Republican colleagues. And the senator is now joining us uh, from Capitol Hill. Senator, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Obviously, it was just weeks ago that your effort to pass uh, this bill with unanimous consent was blocked by Senator Cindy Hydesmith, who at the time put out a statement saying it was because of broad sweeping language that would have had other consequences aside from just the IVF objective. So do you have a plan to resurrect this effort? And if so, could we see what this legislation aims to do narrowed so you wouldn't face the same roadblock? Well, I think her characterization of the bill is incorrect. It is actually a very simple bill. Yes, I will be uh, asking for a roll call vote on the floor. Um, uh, it's something I've been working on since 2014, actually, when I was going through uh, my first rounds of IVF myself. And my doctor said, hey, you know, if these personhood laws pass, your, uh, what, this, what the procedure that we're performing here could become illegal um, because we discarded um, some of the fertilized eggs that we created that were non-viable. Had he implanted those, I would have had a miscarriage. And so we discarded those non-viable fertilized eggs. And he said, if these personhood bills pass, um, I couldn't, I, this would be manslaughter. And so I started working on it, and so I will be reintroducing it. My bill is very simple. It just says you have a statutory right to seek assistive reproductive technology, including IVF, if you want it. Uh, you have the right to offer it uh, if you are meeting all the standard medical practices. If you're a doctor and you want to provide IVF treatment, you can. And if you're an insurance company and you want to cover assistive reproductive technologies, including IVF, then you can cover it. And that, um, you know, that's all it says. It doesn't say you have to seek it, doesn't say you have to provide it, doesn't say you have to cover it. It just says that we Americans have the statutory right to seek assistive reproductive technology. It's a very simple bill. It's sad that my colleague um, would oppose it, but I am going to ask for a floor vote later on this year. Well, Senator, I know you've called out Republicans for hypocrisy on this issue, and we have seen a really interesting evolution uh, over the past month or two here. Donald Trump embracing IVF a couple of days, in fact, before your bill was blocked. Senator Katie Britt got to this in, in the formal Republican response to Joe Biden's State of the Union address. Let's hear what she said and have you respond. Here's Senator Britt. We want families to grow. It's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We want to help loving moms and dads bring precious life into this world. Senator, when you hear words like this and Speaker Mike Johnson saying his party will, quote, protect and preserve, unquote, access to IVF, is the GOP moving in your direction? Not at all. Not a single Republican, including Senator Britt, has come forward to co-sponsor my legislation. Uh, and again, it's very simple. It just says you have the right to access uh, assistive reproductive technology, you have the right to offer it, and you have the right to cover it. It's very simple and not a...
So one Republican, single Republican who says that they support IVF has come forward to co-sponsor the bill. In fact, all they've done is put out uh, uh, resolutions and statements saying they support it that have absolutely no protections under the law. And in the House of Representatives in particular, there are over 100 Republicans who have actually signed on to co-sponsor legislation that says a fertilized egg is a person and it is a child outside of the uterus that has equal rights, in, in some cases more rights, than the woman who would carry that fertilized egg. So they can't have it both ways. You can't say a fertilized egg is a human being with more rights than the woman, or e at least equal rights, and then also say that you support IVF because the nature of IVF is that there are going to be non-viable fertilized eggs that must be discarded. Uh, in Louisiana, there's already a law in the books that says you can't discard any fertilized eggs. Well, Senator, we know that you are very passionate about this issue and we'll look forward to the news of, of you reintroducing your bill later on this year, as you say. In the meantime, though, there is some more immediate business that uh, the Senate needs to take care of. What is your current understanding of the plan in regard to government funding? Are you expecting to spend the weekend? Will we see a partial shutdown before you can actually vote on this minibus? So we are committed to getting this done and not having a government shutdown. It just depends on... Uh, whether or not my Republican colleagues want to play games and try to do, introduce amendments. Uh, there is a deal that has been agreed to uh, by the lead negotiators uh, on the Senate side. I'm really pleased that a uh, bipartisan uh, uh, partnership between Senators Patty Murray and Susan Collins have moved forward and they have made a deal with the House. Um, and so they're working on that deal right now. And if that comes to the floor for a vote um, and we can pass it in whole without adding any amendments to it, it will, it will pass and we won't have government shutdown. Mm -hmm. But if the House attaches any amendments or we attach any amendments, the whole thing could fall apart and we would go well into the weekend. The goal is to get this done without shutdown, which means we would need to pass it by midnight on Friday. Yeah. Lastly, Senator, from your view on the Armed Services Committee and, of course, your experience uh, with the United States military, do you favor giving a loan to Ukraine if that's the only form in which military funding from the U.S. can pass this Congress? Well, it wouldn't address the issue at hand, because the problem is, of the $65 billion in the supplemental package for Ukraine, $55 billion of that actually stays in the United States, and it actually goes to American mm -hmm. defense manufacturers to replenish America's stockpile. So when we gave them our old Abrams tanks, when we gave them our old F-16s, we need to refurbish and, 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 and put back into our stockpiles, you know, uh, those weapons, those uh, munitions. And so we can't give Ukraine a loan to pay to American defense manufacturers to re to, for U.S. stockpiles. Are we going to give ourselves a loan? So the loan thing doesn't work. Um, and, and frankly, what we need to do is pass the supplemental that passed out of the Senate with a very strong bipartisan vote. And the House just needs to come forward and, and pass this legislation now. Got a lot of balls in the air. Senator Tammy Duckworth, we appreciate you talking about all of this with us today on Bloomberg. Come back and see us. Coming up, takeaways from Fed Chair Jay Powell's news conference following the Fed decision today and the two-day FOMC meeting in Washington. We'll have more ahead on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington with breaking news. As the Justice Department makes clear it's set to sue Apple as soon as tomorrow, accusing the company of violating antitrust laws by blocking rivals from accessing hardware and software features of its iPhone. The case marks the third time the Justice Department has sued Apple for antitrust violations in the past 14 years. This probe's been underway since 2019. Shares of Apple are falling after hours on this report. And it's something that, of course, we're going to be talking a lot more about as we learn more here on Bloomberg. Also today, Federal Reserve officials maintaining their outlook for three interest rate cuts this year and moving toward slowing the pace of reducing their bond holdings. Joining us now to get into this a bit more is Michael Bright, Structured Finance Association CEO. Michael, it's great to see you. Um, it looks like we're not going to see any cuts until the second half of the year, I guess May, if uh, we get lucky at this yep. point. Is the Federal Reserve running the risk with higher for longer 
of forcing this economy into a recession and an eye on the housing market, which I know you're watching. Yeah. Um, well, I think that they have to take that risk. I mean, I, I, I think that I've been in the camp that they are going to stay a little bit higher for longer. Um, I noticed that, you know, the dot plots today yeah. suggested three cuts, but on the precipice of only suggesting two. Um, I mean, it's very clear that they're doing exceptionally well on one side of their mandate. Uh, unemployment is very, very low, and that's great. Um, CPI and PCE continue to be sticky high. I, I think the Fed actually faced potentially a credibility crisis last right. year with their miss uh, in terms of thinking that inflation uh, would be very transient. So right. they, had, they really had no choice. I, I think they're going to need to you know, continue to watch the data. Um, but um, it, it, could, it could tip the economy into recession. It's been a very anticipated recession that the yield curve has been planning for, that the markets have been planning for, is yet to arrive. Um, but I think they're doing the right thing by staying the course and looking at the inflation data as it comes in. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's no shortage of political commentary around Federal Reserve policy. And what you've consistently heard, especially from progressive lawmakers, initially was concern that rates were going to stay too high and it was going to impact the labor market. Right. When it was clear that labor market impact wasn't happening, it seems that a lot of that messaging has now shifted to housing and the fact that it's very unaffordable, that mortgage rates yeah. are incredibly high. How much concern do you have about where we are in housing right now and how much risk may be out there? Yeah, for sure. I, I, this rate lock effect is a real thing where people have 3.5% mortgages and so they don't want to sell their home and they, they're kind of stuck in their house and so inventory is very low. Um, for the last two buying seasons, just anecdotally, you drive around – you know, Maryland, Virginia, D.C. area, you see no for sale signs. Oh, believe right? me, I know it. <laughs> it's, it's tough. And, and uh, this year I, I came in optimistic. I said people have to get on with their lives, right? There's, people have things that change. They get changed jobs. They need to move, et cetera. So this has to be finally a breaking point. Well, the weather's pretty nice, and I'm still not seeing any for sale signs out there. So the rate look effect may have a little bit more time to run. Um, as far as the rate impact, if, if we can find a little bit of a range, which I think that we have, so the 10-year note spiked to 5, but then it kind of came back down in the 4.3 area, and it's sort of holding steady in that regard. If that continues, mortgage spread should come in a little bit, and that could be a little bit of relief on the rate front, but it's really a supply problem at the end of the day. We heard from uh, the White House on this, the president's out with a series of proposals to try to unlock some of the stuff we're talking about in the housing market. Kaylee and I spoke with National Economic Council Deputy Director Daniel Hornan about this. We discussed what needs to happen to improve the housing market. This is the view of the White House. Let's listen. I think we really need an approach on housing policy that goes at uh, putting incentives in place to add to the supply of housing. So his plan that he's sent to Congress would lead to the construction of two million homes. Uh, but we also need to take action that goes at unlocking the housing market. But of course, it takes time to build 2 million homes, to get them cleared, to get them permitted. Yep. It takes God knows how much time to get anything past Congress. <laughs> so is there anything that this administration can do now? They're working around the edges. I mean, they're yeah. trying to make some things cheaper. And I think this realtor sediment could, you know, be a game changer in terms of cost. But again, he's right. And I agree. It is a supply problem. I, I think not having housing supply in the infrastructure bill that did pass when the president first took office was a major miss. Uh, I don't have any particular party to blame for that. I just think that that was a real mistake. Yeah. Um, everyone has known that this has been an affordable supply problem for a very long time. A lot of that is at the local and state level. It looks like the president is making some pitch for tax credits and subsidies to try and encourage the development of low-income housing or at least affordable housing. Right. All of that is good, but the nimbyism is real. Yeah. This is a pretty sticky problem. You know, I do worry that you know, we may be entering almost a European style generational shift here where kids live with their parents hmm. until their 30s and it takes a long time to get that first home. Yeah. I really don't want to get stuck in that trap, but it would take a pretty concerted national effort to, to build housing supply. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is all in the red, residential real estate yeah. realm, but there has been a lot of concern in commercial real estate yeah. as well, including increasingly in commercial real estate CLOs, collateralized yep. loan obligations. Yeah. Basically, you bundle all of this risky yeah. debt together. And yet in just the last seven months, according to our reporting, the share of troubled assets held by these CRE CLO products has surged fourfold to more than 7.4 percent. Should we be concerned by that? Well, I think I think commercial real estate is a broad term. So sure. office space is obviously struggling quite a bit. And it's, it's still very unclear, you know, when that finally works its way through the system. I mean, anecdotally, we're in a lease that we've been in for the seven year lease. And we still have two years on it. So we're paying our rent on time. But I guarantee you, we're going to look for a cheaper lease hmm. when that changes. So it's a slow moving um, train in the office space sector. Um, you know, hotels, leisure industry, shopping centers, moving out to the suburbs, those commercial real estate products have been doing very well. So I, I don't 
I'm not in the camp that there's some sort of ticking time bomb uh, uh, out there. I think people have been looking for this shoe to drop for a very long time, and it hasn't. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be vigilant and continue to watch it. I think we just have to work through this sort of structural shift that we're going through in society in terms of the way we relate to work from office, working downtowns. Downtowns are obviously dealing with a lot. I think crime, is, especially in D.C., this has been mm-hmm. an overhang on some of these things. So you got a lot kind of, of macro factors that are at play here um, that all need to be you know, brought to solution uh, in order to avoid anything catastrophic. But uh, it's, it's worth watching. I just am not in the camp that this is an immediate threat. All right, Michael Bright, great to see you here in our Washington studio. Thank you so much for joining us. Michael Bright is the Structured Finance Association CEO. Now coming up, we'll turn to our political panel to discuss the takeaways from yesterday's primaries. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. A new landmark agreement under the Chips and Science Act between my administration and Intel for up to $8.5 billion. It's a smart investment. And that's being paired with over $100 billion from Intel, including $30 billion in Arizona and $30 billion in Ohio. It's among the largest private sector investments ever in the history of Ohio and Arizona. That was President Biden earlier today in Phoenix at Intel's Ocotillo campus. And joining us now is our political panel, Christy Setzer, president and founder of New Heights Communications, and Lauren Tomlinson, partner at Steer PR. Great to see you ladies here in Washington this evening. Of course, Biden hasn't been spending a lot of time here in the district recently. He's been on a grand tour since the State of the Union of many swing states, not just in Arizona, Nevada, but Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia. He's on his way to Texas as we speak. Christy, it's one thing to visit. It's another thing to be visiting with a message that resonates. How would you rate the job the president is doing as he's making this pitch? I mean, I think today is an unequivocal win. Um, When we look at the announcements that he made, uh, not just in Arizona for Intel, but also the announcement on electric vehicles, I mean, these are things that really matter to people. We're talking about 300,000 jobs when, uh, when we talk about the Intel announcement. And, you know, when we're talking about phasing out gas cars, Mm -hmm. um, that's something that that's probably the most significant climate change announcement that he's made throughout his presidency, maybe with the exception of the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's, it's not just campaigning. He's also doing the right thing. And I don't think that we also need to be cynical about it. I think that there is um, there are a lot of times in which doing the right thing politically is also the right thing policy wise, which is also, you know, um, they're all going to help him. Well, you wonder sometimes if he's not being cynical enough. We're talking about <laughs> generational investments, right? That's how they're yeah. pitched. This is for your kids and grandkids. That's not going to help you to get votes in November, though, is it? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, because I love the CHIPS Act. I think it's great that we're investing in this type of technology, especially from a national security perspective, and Mm -hmm. very imperative. But it is, like when you're talking about a political win, uh, the messaging is difficult on these issues because, you know, even the EV Act uh, or the EV rule that came out today, uh, you're looking at 2030, I think, is when they're talking about that actually going into place. You know, the manufacturing plant is going to take so long for all those jobs to be realized that people are not going to be feeling that effect um, in November. Even a second term be over. Exactly. And I think that is the problem is because so much of what they're doing is the investment and not uh, what have you done for me lately. And people are feeling right now, mm-hmm. well, I'm hurting right now. So what am I getting from this right now? And that I think is going to be the economy uh, problem for Biden messaging going into November is because this is like a longer term play. Mm-hmm. He's going to continue to tell people you're going to be fine. The things I'm doing are going to be great. Biden economics is going to work. But people are going to look and say, well, it hadn't helped me yet. Yeah, the difficulty of getting a voter to look forward at maybe the future Biden economy versus looking backward at the Trump economy when they're choosing between an incumbent president and essentially the one next removed in terms of incumbency. And on that note, obviously, we also had primaries in a number of states yesterday. No shocker, both of them won handily. And yet when you look at the actual breakdown, Donald Trump was polling 70 to 80 percent of the vote across these states. Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis were still getting votes. There is still a chunk of the Republican primary electorate, even knowing he has the nomination locked up, that isn't voting for him. What does that say, Lauren? Yeah, it was up to 20% of the GOP in some of those states yeah. where, uh, where 
basically protest votes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think I saw one number where it was, you know, Biden had uh, maybe like one in 10 people protest vote against him. And then uh, Trump had one in five voters protest vote against him, which I think just speaks to the fact that nobody really wanted <laughs> to see a rematch of 2020. Uh, you know, I think it would have been really nice if we had had some different candidates in here. But here we are. Um, so I think people are registering uh, that, you know, they're registering the fact that they didn't want this for the primary. They wanted different younger candidates. Um, and I don't think that that'll necessarily reflect um, how they end up voting in November, which I think is a lot of, of what people are predicting. But I think that people, again, they go to the ballot box and they wanted people to know this isn't what I wanted. Democrats uh, love running against MAGA, it turns out, especially in Ohio, <laughs> although this just happened in yeah. California. We saw it again in the two races we were watching most closely, uh, Christy, in Ohio. Bernie Moreno benefited from hundreds of thousands of dollars yes. in Democratic ads. Uh, Derek Merrin going to be running against Marcy Kaptur now, thanks to support from Democrats. These were the preferred candidates. Is that going to pay off? In November, this is a risky bet, isn't it? It's a risky bet. It's one that makes me very nervous. It made me very nervous in 2022 when they did it in the midterms as well. But for the most part, it played out well for Democrats. It was a bet that paid off <laughs> because in most of those cases, and obviously this is what uh, Democrats are betting on um, in, the, in Ohio as well, that you have a weaker candidate and Bernie Moreno you can sort of think of him as a poor man's Carrie Lake. Um, wow. And <laughs> I, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, but I do think that, you know, Donald Trump has a very long and established record of choosing people who win in the primary and lose in the general. Yeah. Well, and you bring up that that happened to a number of Trump back candidates in 2022. But something that was raised on this program last night by one of our panelists is Trump wasn't on the ballot in 2022. Mm -hmm. He's going to be at the top in 2024, Lauren, what difference does that make for these candidates that he's endorsed? Well, it means that there's going to be a lot higher turnout for Trump supporters and there's going to be a lot of just down ballot ticking. So I don't think that it's fair to compare a midterm result with the presidential because you're looking at such different um, results and such different uh, voting patterns as far as turnout. Um, but, you know, I do think that I, I'm actually curious how much of a split there is this year, considering how disgruntled people are about the choices that they're being given at the top of the ticket. Um, if that results in what we've seen in Georgia happen, where people were voting for Biden at the top and then Republican all the way down the ticket. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it may be that some people vote Trump at the top and then they change their votes for the bottom or more likely a lot of votes for Biden and then they still vote Republican down. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's I think this is going to be a really unique election year, I guess is my point. <laughs> I don't know if we can call this a win for Democrats, but look at the special election in California as well last night. This was Kevin McCarthy's seat, of course. Of course, he's left the building and he's left town. Vince Fong, the state rep backed by Donald Trump and uh, Kevin McCarthy himself, did not meet the grade to avoid a runoff. That means Mike Johnson has several more months of a two-seat majority with that seat <laughs> vacant. It's, it's somewhat of a win for Democrats. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, I, I think the Democrats will be there, um, you know, for... Uh, for Mike Johnson when they need to be on the yep. big things. But um, but there's also a little bit of schadenfreude in that. Maybe a little more leverage. <laughs> uh, coming up with our panel, the speaker aforementioned Mike Johnson says he plans to hold a vote this week on the spending package that we are still waiting to see. We'll be back with our panel with the details. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Committed to getting this done and not having a government shutdown. It just depends on uh, whether or not my Republican colleagues want to play games and try to do, introduce amendments. Uh, there is a deal that has been agreed to uh, by the lead negotiators uh, on the Senate side. I'm really pleased that a uh, bipartisan uh, uh, partnership between Senators Patty Murray and Susan Collins have moved forward. Democratic Senator Tammy Duckworth of Illinois on with us just moments ago as we head for a funding expiration this Friday as we reassemble our political panel. Their take on it, Christy Setzer, president and founder of New Heights Communications, is here along with Lauren Tomlinson, partner at Steer PR. Uh, she's pointing at Republicans here playing games. I don't know if that is what will take place in the Senate, but it sure looks like we're going to have a little bit of a shutdown here. Is this going to be a learning experience for anyone 
<laughs> having pushed it this close to the line that, that we can only help but shut down. I think it'll be a learning experience for Johnson because yeah. I think that he is slowly learning that it is very difficult to uh, gain consensus um, in the House. And, uh, you know, basically, once you have a deal, you have to really stick to that deal and push it forward and force your members to come along with it. I think that's where the learning is going to occur. I think your rank and file members, some of the ones that have already been telegraphing that they um, don't support the deal before they've read it, that they don't support additional funding, it doesn't cut enough, you know, all of the same things. Yeah. Um, I think they're not learning anything from this, that shutdowns are expensive and they're not good for the country. And so you actually run counter to your principles there. Mm -hmm. Well, Lauren, you mentioned a lot of people are saying no before they've laid eyes on the bill. And yet those people also maybe want 72 hours to read the bill, even though they're ultimately going to vote no for it. Should we just waive that rule, considering this is going to be passed under suspension of the rules? So why would the rules apply in this case? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally members should read bills before they pass them, right? Like, that is a good thing for democracy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I think at this point, um, you know, stay up all night and read it and then pass it, right? And then if we need to, because this is a special situation, like, make sure that uh, you trust leadership enough that you're going to want to vote for the bill. But also, if you don't want to get in this situation, go through the normal appropriations process and pass bills on time. <laughs> pass bills on time. Novel idea. This is the comedy portion of the program. <laughs> um, so, Christy, after this is done, presuming this gets done, yeah. maybe we shut down for a couple of days or there's a CR. We'll get to the fine print at some point here. Uh, there's a question about whether there's going to be room for anything else. We talked to Senator Duckworth about Ukraine funding, for instance. Mm -hmm. There's some big issues that are left remaining that this Congress may not be able to get to as all members go on recess here and they're reminded that they're in campaign mode in a couple of months. Right. Is the store closed? I don't know if it's closed. I think it's much harder to get things passed after that point. Uh, look, I, I was never under the impression that Democrats wouldn't help uh, you know, get the government funded because we believe in government. We believe in funding it. We believe in running it. We don't tend to take it hostage. Uh, you know, yes, we're going to go through this rigor and roll every single time and take it right to the edge. But it's always going to be that Democrats are going to be there in partnership to get things passed. And as it turns out, it seems as though from the, you know, minibus that actually some long-held Democratic priorities, things like child care funding at this point, mm -hmm. we don't know, but seem to be in it. Um, so that's good. But that, I think, is where the, uh, the goodwill ends. Um, I think at that point, then it, we go back to, you know, partisanship and um, and a lot of rancor. I'm, I'm very unconfident that some of the big things that I think are incredibly critical, like Ukraine funding, mm -hmm. um, actually come to a resolution. Well, on that point, Bloomberg spoke with Ukraine's prime minister earlier today and was asked specifically about whether he'd had any reassurances about that aid. This was his response. Nearest time, uh, this month uh, or maximum next month, we will have this good news from United States and the United States will join to European Union, to G7 coalition, uh, I mean uh, military and financial support of Ukraine in this uh, battle with uh, Russia. This month or next month, Lauren, is that overly optimistic or is the House going to suddenly start singing a different tune? I think that that's realistic. Um, you know, I think that, you know, you have to project confidence a little bit like the Ukrainians are sure. doing. But I actually do think that's a realistic timeline if they can get through this shutdown moment. You know, that has always been Johnson's uh, clear line is we need to pass our own bills first. We need to make sure that the government is funded. I need to get through this appropriations mess. And then we will turn to Ukraine and Israel funding. And I do actually think that um, in some ways Donald Trump has freed the uh, Republicans from having to put all of these d domestic priorities onto this bill because he told them that he wants to handle border security himself. Mm -hmm. So now they can just pass a clean Ukraine funding and there's enough support between the Democrats and the Republicans um, that I think that it'll pass. Uh, interesting today. Well, uh, Speaker Johnson was meeting with his conference on 72 hours and rules like that. The Republican senators had a meeting that Benjamin Netanyahu appeared at. Yeah. Republican senators. There was not a Democrat in the room following Chuck Schumer's speech last week. What does that tell you about where we stand? Well, it tells you that Netanyahu said he was happy to meet with the Democrats and Chuck Schumer said no. And the reason he said no is because he thought that if Netanyahu wanted to meet with them separately, first talking to the Republicans and then talking to the Democrats or vice versa, mm -hmm. that that's going to harden, you know, partisanship um, on this issue, that we should be able to come up with something together. So I think it's a reflection of the fact that um, that we've gone back 
into our corners, uh, Democrats and Republican, on you know what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Not a great thing. Of course, aid for Israel is also wrapped up in this entire supplemental yes, question. Right. Christy Setzer and Lauren Tomlinson, great to have you both this evening. We appreciate your time. And, of course, for more coverage on all of these topics and more, check out the Washington Edition newsletter. You can find that on the terminal, and you can find it online as well. We'll meet you back here tomorrow. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power, only on Bloomberg TV and radio.